Thank you very much to Klaus for lending me his computer. Uh, so I would like to thank the organizers for this wonderful opportunity to speak here. Uh, I'm very happy to see many familiar faces. So I would like to talk about recent work, I mean, uh, recent or dating back to two or three years, but maybe not of you, and all of you are aware of this, so I thought it was a good opportunity to present. And uh, some of this work is, uh, a lot of this work is done in collaboration with Gabrielle Perret uh, and her, his student, uh, Audrey V at ENS, Francis Bach at INREA, Klaus and Grégoire at New Berlin. So uh, I, I thought I would just start by explaining what is this uh, keyword, optimal transport. Uh, and uh, some of you might be familiar with these ideas, some of you may not. So just to recapitulate, it's a geometric toolbox to compare probability measures supported on a metric space. This is a very informal definition, but I think it would be useful. And it's a theory that dates back to uh, Monge uh, in the uh, 18th century, late 18th century. Then Kantorovich uh, provided very uh, defining ideas. Th th those ideas were numerically solved by Danzig using linear programming. For some reason, people call this the Wasserstein distance, but there is a bit of a disagreement. And then we have a uh, few more recent mathematicians, and now I can even say a politician who has been, have been involved in optimal transport. So if you want to, to go into politics, there is a probability one that you need to do optimal transport if you're a mathematician. So, uh, so just to, 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 to illustrate this, um, what I mean by probability measures is, well, you all know what a probability measure is, and you all know how versatile it is as a representation for data, for tools, for statistics, for bags of words, for color histograms, for images, etc. So this, we, this is what we're going to deal with. We're going to compare probability distributions. So of course, probability distributions might be regarded as one item, one object in your database. So a text is a bag of words. But of course, you can also look at them at a meta level which is basically a probability distribution, is a statistical model for a database. So I will consider a bit both of those, uh, th those aspects. And the important aspect of uh, optimal transport is that we need to compare two probability distributions living in a, a certain space to have a proper notion of geometry on that space. So typically, we will need, if you want to compare two bags of words using optimal transport, to have a notion of metric or cost, substitution cost between the word, any word here and any word here. So if you want, it's a way of uh, using a base metric on a space of observations to define a meta metric on the space of probability distributions on those observations. And you can see how, why this can be useful. Well, because in many cases, we have such an information. We have such a knowledge. So typically, if you compare color histograms, none of you intuitively would like to take the kullback liber divergence between this histogram, color histogram and this color histogram because first it will blow up. And then, obviously, you want to take into account somewhere the fact that this color is close to this color, et cetera, et cetera. So this intuition is what we're trying to leverage in optimal transport. Um, now, building from this, so this idea of optimal transport, yielded a distance which is known as the Wasserstein distance. Maybe many, many of you might be familiar with it. Uh, what's more interesting, I believe, is that it also creates a whole geometry to compare probability distributions and to interpolate probability distributions. And this was realized not so long ago, about 20 years ago, by McCann. And he basically said, OK, if there is an optimal transport distance between this distribution and this distribution, here we have just two mixtures of Gaussians. Well, there's also an interesting way we can interpolate between them. And uh, just to illustrate, obviously, this is very different from the regular and usual interpolation of measures that we are familiar with, with the Euclidean geometry. For instance, if you have this blue measure here and this red measure here, their mean, if you were to ask anyone to ask to compute the mean between two, these two measures, well, it would be something that would be like this, and their interpolation basically would be something moving vertically. In optimal transport, we incorporate this distance, if you want, on the base space here, and so interpolation kind of moves mass optimally. So this has more of a physical meaning, if you want, and the main question now in optimal transport is, can we use that physical meaning efficiently? Can we make it numerically efficient to be useful in machine learning tasks? So the, the, to illustrate this, well, I just showed you one interpolation between two measures. This might look a bit trivial, but now we maybe want to try between three measures. For instance, what is the, the barycenter between these three measures? So this is a problem that surprisingly has only attracted attention recently. 
in 2011, and there have been some numerical algorithms presented to solve it, and I will mention that. So let me just make a, a, a stop here and say, why can this be, this be useful for data analysis, for machine learning, for deep learning? Well, here we have a theory which is very clearly uh, belonging to mathematicians. Uh, it was really developed by mathematicians, mostly after all of the uh, efforts by Kantorovich and Danzig, some, of numeri some numerics. Then mathematicians really started focusing their attention on this in the 90s and 2000s. And this is uh, how one of the reasons why Cédric Villani got, got a Fields Medal. So we have this beautiful mathematical field. It has <laughs> had some impact on theoretical computer science and, and, and graphics and computer vision with under the name of the Earth Movers Distance. Maybe some of you know it under that name. And there's also very beautiful TCS work on, on, on that aspect. But in practice, there have, they have been very little applications of this distance to, I would say, machine learning or large-scale data analysis. And in my opinion, well, the first one is very clear and it's pretty obvious for anyone who has tried to use optimal transport, is that it's very heavy computationally speaking. The second one, in my opinion, is that the distance is not uh, differentiable in its original form. So why am I saying this matters? Well, because we are constantly differentiating kullback liber constantly differentiating the squared Euclidean distance, and this is part of a, a pipeline. And if you can't do this, well, usually you don't want to use a distance, for instance, that's not differentiable as a loss. So one, one, one uh, area of, of work uh, which I've been investigating with co-authors recently is this idea of regularizing the optimal transport problem with entropy. So I will show you that from a computational perspective, this is really, really advantageous. Well, most, mostly, as Alex mentioned NVIDIA in his previous talk, because of uh, advances in the GPUs, you typically want your algorithms to be GPU friendly, meaning you want them to be at some point matrix vector products, and this reformulation of optimal transport, as you will see, is such a, is in that case. I will also show that because it's, it's regularized, it's also differentiable. And one of the nice developments that, that we have found recently is that uh, it's not only differentiable, if you really go, do, go into the math, but actually you can come up with very simple hacks to make it automatically differentiable, meaning that it's deep learning toolbox uh, compatible. And so there is, I think, a, a trend of using that, that loss, the Wasserstein loss. Wasserstein design has a simple loss somewhere in your, in your deep learning architecture. And the last part of my talk would be about how this distance can be used to fit distributions or generative models to data. So let me go a bit to ma into math, because I think it's, it's, it's worth knowing the history of the problem. So we have a space, omega. And we're going to consider that it has a geometry. There is a distance t. It doesn't really matter that it's a distance or not. It could be a cost, but let's say it's a distance. So Monge asked the following problem. He said, imagine I have a probability distribution here, and I have another probability distribution there. Imagine this is a pile of sand that I have, and this is where I need to move the sand, because I want to build a wall, maybe, or maybe a castle or anything. So if you think in practical terms, you would typically need to move at each of those points with a, with a shovel, put, bring, put some sand in your shovel, and bring it somewhere there, right? And you can assume that the cost of bringing sand from one location to the other is basically how much do I need to travel? So that would be the distance between x and tx. And also, is there a lot of sand in this location, of course? If, if there's one kilo of sand, maybe I will use a few calories per meter. If there's 10 kilos, then I will use 10 times that, that energy. And you want to minimize this. So what you want to do is find a map T that brings all this mass x at, at those x's to uh, this measure nu here. You're going to pay, each time you bring some mass from x to x, you're going to pay the distance, and then proportionally to how much mass you're transporting. Now, not any map T will ensure that when I have followed all those instructions, I will recreate exactly the measure that I want. And that's the point, right? I want to compare one measure mu with another measure nu. And all the maps that do this, basically I call the push forwards. So I want to basically bring the mass from mu to nu using this map t. And so the push forward of this measure mu under the action of t here must be equal to the blue measure in the end. So this was the, the way more somehow characterize this problem. 
What you can very instantly see is that this problem doesn't work as soon as you add data into it. So, and by data, I mean basically Dirac masses, points. As when you have a smooth measure, it all works fine. But whenever I have a delta mass at one point x here, there's no function t such that if I bring all the mass here, I will recreate this blue measure, right? I can only recreate the delta mass there. And so this is why Mo, uh, Kantorovich, and this is what, what people credit to Kantorovich, and what the main reason why he got the, the Nobel Prize, he said, well, rather than looking for a deterministic map that brings some mass from x to t of x, I will look for some probabilistic map. And what I mean a probabilistic map is, well, if you have some mass at x, well, I will scatter that mass around proportionally to the amount of mass at x that I had, and that will form a probability distribution. And that's the idea of introducing couplings. So a coupling, a joint probability distribution, is basically a, a probabilistic map, if you want. So what is a coupling? A coupling is any joint probability distribution on the space of uh, uh, omega times omega here, such that if you just push the mass all in this direction, you get the first measure. If you just push it in this direction, you get the second measure. So the marginal, the first marginal is mu, the second marginal is mu. So of course, you have several maps. That uh, several couplings that satisfy this. In particular, I think this is the product coupling of the two measures. So this is the one with the maximal entropy. And so there's always such a coupling that exists. Whereas for, for Monge, sometimes you would have some ill pose problem. And then what Kantorovich proposed was this. So we don't really know why we call it the Wasserstein distance. We should probably call it the Kantorovich distance. But he said, I'm going to consider the inf over all couplings of the coupling that has the lowest expected distance cost, if you want, x, y to the power p. And this is called the primal optimal transfer problem. And if you look at it, this is basically a continuous linear program. You are defining uh, couplings with linear constraints. This is a linear objective. The coupling is not negative, so everything is, is, uh, is linear. He, the reason why he got the Nobel Prize is because he, he was the first to propose a dual optimal problem, optimal, uh, sorry, uh, uh, optimization problem corresponding to this one. So I, I will not dwell too much into those details, but this is the, 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 the definition of Wasserstein distances. The very nice thing about this definition, if you look into a bit the mechanics, is that this works for every measure. So this is unlike, for instance, kullback Kleiber. This works whenever you're comparing a discrete measure with a discrete measure. It works when you're comparing a discrete measure with a continuous one and a continuous with a continuous. So now, the definition here works for any case. How to compute it? Well, it's a, it's a different problem, right? Well, if in, you are in the discrete versus discrete case, the default solver is a linear program. It's a basically a network flow solver. If you are in this case, you will have to resort to stochastic optimization to, to, to solve this. And we, have been exp we mentioned this in, in our recent NIPS paper. So let me just uh, mention a bit this idea in the discrete, discrete case. What happens when you're comparing this? You can see this as a point cloud, weighted point cloud, with another weighted point, point cloud. And you want to basically map transport optimally the first one to the second one. So this is a bit of a registration problem, if you want. So the first measure is defined by weights AI, so all the, the length of those sticks, and locations XIs, all the lo all locations of those sticks here. And the, the new measure, the blue one, is BJs, DY, uh, delta YJs. So the optimal transfer problem in this case is arguably the first uh, linear program that was ever studied. If you look at many optimization uh, uh, books. This is typically one of the first problems that's, that's uh, presented. And it goes as follows. It will say, I am going to form a distance matrix that will contain all the geometry between those points x, y, and y, j's. I will create a feasible set of matrices. So the, this is the polytope of matrices that have fixed row sums and fixed column sums. And I'm going to optimize on that polytope and find the matrix here in this case, or the joint coupling here, that has the lowest uh, dot product with the metric. So this is the, the, the linear program. And um, if you want to look at this visually, you have two measures, mu and nu, the red and the blue. The red is defined by locations x and weights a. The blue is defined by locations y and weights b. Taken together, they define a matrix. This is a cost matrix. 
a set of matrices, the set of joint probability tables or contingency tables, or et cetera. And we're trying to find the table here that has the lowest dot product with this matrix. Okay? So this is a well-known problem. As I said earlier, this also has a dual optimal uh, linear program. Blah, blah, blah. The problem is this is costly. Okay? It's costly to solve this uh, linear program, it, depending on your perspective. If you're a linear programming expert, this is very, very fast. Because in, for network flows, we have very efficient solvers. But if, if you come from a machine learning perspective, this is too costly. That's the first problem. The se second problem, in my opinion, is that the solution is not stable. In, because it's the solution of a linear program, we all know that if you just wiggle a bit this cost function, then you might all of a sudden get an infinite number of solu optimal solutions. But what's more problematic is that you can jump very easily from one corner to the other. And if you want to put this in optimization pipeline, it means that this, is, this quantity is not differentiable. So the fix that I uh, proposed uh, uh, in a NIPS paper in 2013, which is basically uh, is, it's all news. It, this was uh, considered uh, in the 60s by economists, is to regularize the optimal transport problem by adding some entropy term here. So you, you basically want to minimize the cost of this coupling, but you want to ask some entropy from it. You want, to, you want something that's a bit entropic. And why is this somehow counterintuitive? Well, it is counterintuitive because the optimal, not counterintuitive, but why is it not so, let me just, why is it uh, a bit against, if you want, the idea of optimal transport? Well, optimal transport, if you look into the math, and if you recall this idea of the Monge formulation of optimal transport, I'm trying to find a map which associates one point to one point only. If you actually run optimal transport of this kind of distribution here, you need, this is a unidimensional and not a unidimensional distribution. This, this, so we have a VGA projector, so you cannot see. This is what the optimal transport matrix looks like. It's extremely degenerate. It's basically a small, thin curve in this matrix of size 100 times 100. Which means that if you want to really build this wall using the pile of sand, well, you know exactly at each area, at each point where you should bring the sand. You're not going to take some sand and then disperse it a bit around. And then I'm telling you that you want some entropy. This is counterintuitive, right? Because what I want is something that's a bit more blurry than this. Okay? And this is actually what you obtain when you start adding more entropy into your optimization problem. So note that to go from here to here, it's not just equivalent to applying a blur. Okay? If, you, if you apply a blur to this, you would not satisfy the constraint, the, the marginal constraint. So um, the, 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 the nice thing about this regularization is basically, and I'm, I'm going to be a bit fast on, on this topic, that it results in an algorithm which is much, much faster to execute than the linear program solvers that we all know. And uh, it's basically an algorithm known as a synchron fixed point iteration. Basically, it's just a for loop and two lines of code at each line. And each line is a matrix vector product, and this is e extremely fast in applications. If you want to study further this regularization, then we have proposed some papers in the past. Oh, sorry. Um, so let me just skip these two slides and maybe come back to them. We have proposed some papers in the past where we have said, if you want to uh, differentiate this, this regularized quantity, you can go into math and look at different things. Then we can do, you can use uh, Legend duality to uh, come up with nice convex programs. But now I think in 2017, uh, the, the way people would uh, use this is the way a programmer would use this, and is automatic differentiation, basically. So what I glossed a bit over is that you can very quickly approximate the Wasserstein distance using a, an algorithm called the Synchron algorithm, which is 100 iterations of a very simple thing. And this Synchron algorithm, basically, can be automatically differentiated if you, if you, if you implemented this in, in, in your favorite toolbox. So this is how we have been using this, 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 this regularized Wasserstein distance recently. So in the very short time that I'm allotted, I'm going to just tell you what you can do with the Wasserstein distance and data. So the first thing we, or you might know, is that the k-means problem is actually a Wasserstein distance problem. The k-means problem is finding a measure mu which has k atoms 
which minimizes the Wasserstein distance to your, between you and data. Some people have been considering other flavors of Wasserstein plus data problems, and there is a very big literature in this field in math. What we have been doing with this regularization in this fast tool to compute Wasserstein distance and approximate them is basically solve a big list of ideas that you might have and that kernel people might have had in the 90s when they discovered the kernel trick. So we have some, some PCA, the dictionary learning with the Wasserstein geometry, Barry centers and minimum, minimum counter of each estimation. So I will, I'm going to just simply show you a few pictures on Barry centers because I think it's cool. And I'm not going to talk about algorithms at all, but we have nice algorithms to do this. So imagine that this was the first experiment we did. Imagine that you have those images. Each image is one data point, and each image is a measure, probability measure, and you want to average them. If you average them with Euclidean geometry, this is what happens. If you average them with the Wasserstein geometry, this is what happens. So this seems to be uh, tackling some interesting aspect. We had some graphics application. For instance, you want to average, don't ask me why, but you want to average those three 3D shapes, and uh, you want to interpolate between them. And again, we have very fast algorithms that allow us to do this. And we've, we presented this at, 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 at next year with a, a few more refinements. So you have a lot of very nice interpolations, physical interpolations between objects without any modeling, basically. There's no modeling involved here. It's only pure optimal transport theory plus just distance between pixels in 3D. I'm going to skip this to go to the uh, next, the last topic of my talk, which is basically minimum Kantorovich estimators. So what is basically estimation. You have a family of distributions p theta. You have a measure new data, which is an empirical measure that doesn't fit maybe into this ball. And you want to find one p theta star, which represents best your data. And to do this, you will typically want to minimize some criterion of distance or divergence between this measure and the one that you get in your ball. If you follow this idea using the Kullback library divergence between new data and p theta, then you get maximum likelihood estimation. So the natural question is, what happens when you do this with a Wasserstein distance? And this is called minimum Kantorovich estimation. And this was proposed in 2006 by um, uh, Italian mathematicians, statisticians, uh, uh, who only studied it in theory. So you might think this sounds like a very crazy idea to change Kullback library by a different measure. But no, there's people that have been arguing, for instance, minimum chi-square, not maximum likelihood, minimum Hellinger distance, minimum Kantorovich. In this book by Luc de Vroy and Gabor Lugosi, they also considered L1 minimization. So this is a fa very, very st fairly standard idea. The problem is implementing it. How can you implement this minimization of Wasserstein distance between the data and the actual, uh, the, the actual p theta? So in a paper by, with, with uh, Grégoire and Klaus, we proposed this with, uh, with for discrete models, probability distributions, with very large state spaces. This was a, for a restricted Boltzmann machine. And the whole thing boils down to this. You have a Wasserstein distance between p theta and new data. This is the dual formulation of optimal transport. This is the regularization that I've been talking about. I presented it in the primal, but in the dual, this takes this form. And this is what you want to minimize, basically. You want to minimize the max of something. And if you just look into the math, you can recover a gradient for this quantity by differentiating, taking the Jacobian of your p thetas to be respect to thetas and computing this alpha star. So minimizing a Wasserstein distance between data and model is the same thing as trying to compute the optimal dual variable in this Kantorovich formulation. So uh, I, I refer to the paper if you want to have uh, more details. So what happens next with, in a continuous setting? So you have a measure which is new data, and you have a measure p theta. And you want to change this p theta to make it closer in Wasserstein distance to your points. Well, in this case, you might just use again the Wasserstein, the, the Kantorovich formulation of optimal transport, and again minimize this stuff. And this, we have talked about this in the NIMS paper in 2016, the same year. Now, the very nice uh, uh, innovation that people have thought about, and this is also related to Alex's talk when he was talking about the very recent focus on, uh, the, the strong focus on generative models, is instead of playing with those very big p thetas which, have, which are carrying mass everywhere, what about latent models? So we have a latent space, and I'm going to call the original space the data space, and I'm going to push forward so this is why I defined the push forward in the first slides, the latent space into the data space 
And of course, if this latent space is very small dimensional, the, what I would get is a very thin manifold in this data space. And now what you want to do is do minimum Kantorovich estimation, but in this generative model setting. So instead of trying to directly optimize p theta, we are going to optimize the f theta and, and consider that the mu, the first measure, is fixed. And this is what people have uh, uh, considered in the WGAN paper in a specific case where the transport distance, uh, the transport cons uh, optimal transport distance considered is the W1 distance, for which this dual problem here simplifies quite a lot. So there's a few developments on these topics. We have two, two archive uh, two, uh, papers on, uh, recently on this, so I, I would refer to them if you want more details. So to conclude, uh, I just want to say that optimal transport can be used in several crucial machine learning tasks. Uh, the entropy, entropy is a very effective regularizer, and people have been working on these topics quite a lot. And there are some interesting generalizations of, of optimal transport. Some of them actually go, uh, are related also to uh, some work by Alex a few years ago on kernelized sorting. So quadratic, and this was a bit mentioned by yourself, by Lyor in, in his talk about how you can uh, ensure this, the fact that a map uh, maps a point X to a point, if, if X and Y are not too far away, F and X and F of Y are not too far away, so this is also related. Uh, and so, anyway, uh, I'm going a bit over time, so thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you. So, questions? So what, what advantages do you see when using Wasserstein distance as estimators? I mean, people use, for example, beta divergence or gamma divergence because of its, of its robustness. Mm -hmm. So what, what advantages do you get when you use Wasserstein distance? Uh, so I think, um, I think the, the best case to explain this is probably this one. It's when you're basically trying to estimate a degenerate distribution that doesn't have a density everywhere in your space. Think about k-means. So we have, we have forgotten about k-means. But if you think about k-means, you have a probability measure, new data. And you're trying to, so we, we have all this pipeline of clustering in our minds. But what we're basically trying to do is some kind of probability estimation, density estimation. But our density is very degenerate. It's just a sum of Dirac's. It's just a bunch of Dirac's. We're trying to model the probability distribution, which is Dirac's, with another distribution, which is Dirac's. And then we can't do it with the usual density estimation, uh, uh, maximum likelihood, because none of this works. So what you can do is use Gaussian models with a very thin sigma, and then all of a sudden things work, right? At the minute you start using a Gaussian which puts mass everywhere, then things don't blow up anymore. But the minute you say, OK, I want a Dirac mass and zero elsewhere, this doesn't work. Same thing, you could, so in, our, in a recent preprint, we, we propose this, for instance, think about a model where your probability distribution model is just spheres or balls. You want to model, you want to approximate a probability distribution with, by a sum of balls, okay? Zero mass except uniform mass in the ball. So it would be a generalization of k-means. This you can't do with any other divergence. Okay, I see, thank you. So before we think of a smart question, what did this guy get the Nobel Prize for? In which oh, no, no, area? the fields, the fields one. Oh, fields, fields. Uh, so he, he, he... Oh, yes, 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 Katorovic is economy. Yes, 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 yes. Katorovic is economy. 73, I think. So you're using the entropy to regularize, yes. but probably you could also regularize with some other prior knowledge. Oh, yes, yes, and yes. So the, the, the excellent question, uh, one that people have been thinking about for, for quite a time. For, uh, it seems that none, none, I mean, there is quadratic, for instance, regularization. There are many different regularizers that you can, you can think of, but none of them streamline so efficiently as entropy in terms of computation. In the end, everything plays a beauty. So actually, this is related to the fact that if you use entropy there, <laughs> what you're essentially doing is using kullback liber geometry on the space of couplings. So there, everything is nice. 
So somehow I've been uh, hitting a bit on Kubla Kleiber for, for, for a few minutes, but actually if you, if you transfer it to the space of joint couplings, then Kubla Kleiber is really super helpful. This is what really helps. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's a very nice idea to regularize with entropy, but you introduce a new parameter, of course. So, sorry? You introduce a new parameter. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So while it's easy to quantify performance, you, you said yes. so the, the new parameter is going to control how robo robust. Yes. Can you quantify that? Yes, so this is a very good question. Um, so I, I, would, I would think that in this case, uh, uh, it, it, somehow there we, we have a ground truth, if you want. We have the true optimal transport distance is basically gamma goes to zero, and so numerically you might be tempted to let gamma go to zero as fast as possible. But then numerically this breaks down. This breaks down because at some point, I, I really went very fast on this, I'm sorry, but uh, we, have, we are basically computing a matrix exponential here, and if gamma becomes zero, then of course the entries of this thing go to uh, become zero, because this, this becomes very large, and very large negative, so it becomes zero. And then you have division here, and so you can imagine that you're going to divide by zero. And so this is well understood. So people in graphics have been using it in the following way. They really want gamma to be as small as possible. And so they have devised, actually, clever tricks to, to get this to work for even for small gamma equals zero. But actually, what this also brings as an interesting problem is a statistical problem. If you are doing optimal transport, typically, or the way people were using it for a long time, is you're just comparing two probability distributions. OK, fine. So you want to compute the best approximation of the Vincent distance. If you're computing this, you need to sample. And so there is an overfitting problem that comes into play. Because this is a minimum of something, you're basically overfitting somewhat, if you want to approximate these two things. Imagine this is a sample of this. If you were to compute the mean of this, then you would be overfitting. So this regularization is a bit of a way of fighting this, this, uh, this variance. I think we have to uh, stop and uh, thank the speaker again for the excellent talk. Uh, now we have a...